The pace of climate change is accelerating much faster than scientists had originally predicted. Climatologists around the world are urging immediate action to slow that pace and warning that if we are to sustain life on this planet, a worldwide commitment to fundamentally change how we develop and use energy is urgently needed. Against this backdrop, a small group of investors, banks, entrepreneurs, and politicians is practicing business as usual, developing and building out new fossil fuel infrastructure that will permit the continuation of the very policies that have created this circumstance. The construction of a massive pipeline network across New England for the purpose of bringing fracked natural gas from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia to export terminals on the Atlantic coast represents the triumph of greed over reason and the victory of a small group of climate deniers over the overwhelming majority of scientists. You would think that folks engaged in this kind of reckless behavior would be scorned by society, that people of good character would say, enough. But you'd be missing the point. An elaborate, expensive, and amazingly effective public relations campaign has been waged over the past few years to convince Americans that natural gas is the necessary link to our energy future. Natural gas has been a source of energy for more than a century. But now we have a brand new technology to extract gas buried deep within shale formations. This new technology, called fracking, which was invented by the Halliburton Company, came along just as people were beginning to understand that burning fossil fuels was contributing to climate change. The timing couldn't have been worse. Halliburton spent hundreds of millions of dollars perfecting this technology that uses toxic chemicals and explosives to essentially blast the gas out of the ground. And increasingly, the public is beginning to wonder if burning any kind of fossil fuel is a good idea. Investors are nervous. Billions of dollars are on the line. So Halliburton and others involved in the gas industry develop an elaborate advertising campaign built on the premise that natural gas is the answer to our energy problems, a bridge fuel that burns cleaner than coal or oil. Methane extracted from shale formations, for example those in the United States, is the worst possible fossil fuel from the point of view of climate change. It's not a bridge. When you look at the whole picture, it's, it's not a clean alternative by, by any stretch of the imagination. When you look at the numbers, uh, over a 20-year time frame, methane, CH4, is 86 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So you only need a little bit of leakage of, 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 that, of that raw methane to totally cancel out any benefit that you have from switching from coal to gas. Like you said, it's still a fossil fuel. Pipelines leak. It's what they do. Sometimes enough gas collects in a certain spot and then it explodes. Sometimes they just leak gas into the air, not enough to actually explode, but enough to be a problem. Transmission gas pipelines can fail in different modes over distribution lines. They can both have terrible tragic failures, but uh, we've had some very terrible tragedies across the United States. After the uh, implementation of integrity management for gas transmission lines, and basically, my opinion is, while some companies get it, too many other companies do, do not get it, and that they're trying to find legal loopholes not to do what they really should be doing. Rick Kuprowitz is a pipeline safety expert and used to work for one of the big gas companies in charge of pipeline safety, back in the days when gas companies actually owned and built the pipelines. Rick and his company had a vested interest in building safe pipelines. They didn't want to lose gas from leaks, and they didn't want them to blow up either. But that's not the way pipelines are built today. Today, pipeline companies build pipelines as fast and as cheaply as they can. You know, large diameter, high pressure uh, pipeline operations. And they're multi-billion dollar projects. And usually these multi-billion dollar projects, by their very nature, tend to say, the sooner the better that they get into operation, you know, business says the cash flow starts. And that's an example where the focus on just the financial numbers can cause groups of very smart people uh, to do the wrong thing. 
What's up with the future of natural gas? Well, just look down, deep underground. That's where the intense advertising campaign around the gas rush has two main focus points. The first is energy independence. The second is jobs. Television screens across the country are filled with images of happy people working in the gas industry, accompanied by uplifting, inspirational music. If you don't know anything about natural gas and you're not aware you're being sold something, it's easy to be taken in. One of the benefits that is always exaggerated is job creation. And everybody wants jobs. Everybody needs jobs in the communities, you know, so that sounds great. But those job estimates are, are, are very inflated. Um, many of the jobs are very short-term and transient type, type jobs. Most of them are just construction jobs while the pipeline is being built. But to actually run a pipeline and operate a pipeline ongoing requires very few workers. So job creation is very, very low over the, over the long term. Most of those, the construction jobs that are being created on a short-term basis are being filled by people from other states where they have a lot more experience building pipelines. And when transient workers come for a short amount of time, most of their wages get sent home to their families in their own states to be spent there, so it's helping the economies in their own states. It's not helping the economies in the states where they're, they're working for a couple of weeks here and there. So the gas rush is on. Fracking for natural gas is going on in Pennsylvania and Ohio and other places. Pipelines are being constructed all over the Northeast to carry the gas through our neighborhoods and towns and villages and cities. And even if the pipelines don't leak and never explode, the build-out of the gas delivery infrastructure is taking a heavy toll on families who happen to live in the way. My name is Pramila Malik. I've lived in this house for about 16 years now. I found myself with three boys and decided that I needed a country property for them to run around. From my perspective, it was a way for my children to see what really matters in the world. Pramila Malik and her family live in a home in the tiny upstate hamlet of Minisink, New York. It's a middle-class kind of town, filled with American flags, church steeples, and small family-owned stores. It's the kind of place you go because it's quiet and peaceful. And then a new neighbor moved in. So in 2011, we received a letter in the mail. It said that your new neighbor is about to be a gas compressor station. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. We're a rural residential community. It's a protected agricultural district. There must be some mistake here. A compressor station is part of the natural gas delivery infrastructure. Every 40 or 50 miles, the gas needs to be recompressed to a specific pressure so it can be sent through the pipeline. These are big, noisy industrial operations with giant compressor engines that run 24-7, emitting toxic pollutants along with escaping methane. Occasionally, they shut the engines down and perform maintenance activities such as blowdowns that also release significant amounts of methane and other toxic chemicals into the air. This is not the kind of thing you want in your backyard. So initially we were told that our local zoning laws would apply and that the company would comply with them. But then when, when we showed them our local zoning laws that this is strictly prohibited, then all of a sudden they retracted that and said, no, 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 we don't need to apply, comply with your local zoning laws. Despite the objections of nearly everyone in the town, the mini-sink compressor station built in the middle of a residential neighborhood went into operation. You know, there were nights that I would wake up at like two in the morning and just suddenly not be able to breathe for no reason whatsoever. And I have no history of breathing problems. And then in a subsequent phone call with our DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation, the uh, response of the regulator was, yeah, well, Millennium admitted that they were venting in the middle of the night, but now they've agreed to do it in the middle of the day. So basically, you know, you can either get poisoned in the middle of the night when you're sleeping, or you could get poisoned in the middle of the day. Take your pick. One of the things driving the gas rush is the relatively low cost of natural gas compared to coal or oil. Gas is cheap, and uh, that's a big concern because that is incentivizing many, many people to convert their home heating systems to natural gas systems. 
uh, we're producing uh, a tremendous amount of our electricity now from fracked gas. And for other purposes as well, home heating, uh, there's a tremendous conversion to natural gas from, from other sources. And all of this is taking us in the wrong direction. I know that shale gas is going to go away. As the supply of something decreases, if the demand stays constant, the price goes up. Watch your bills because uh, over time, the, the, the price that you pay for the natural gas that you're being told is going to be cheaper and more efficient for you, that cost is going to go up. And the uh, gas industry is banking on that. The price of wind, water, and sunlight in any renewable energy system will always be zero, but the price of natural gas is likely to increase substantially. The claim that we cannot meet our energy needs without continuing to burn fossil fuels has been advanced largely by those with a financial stake in the energy industry and those who are dependent on them for political and financial support. The underlying assumption of this theory is a paradox, that somehow we can mitigate the rapidly advancing threat of climate change while we continue to burn fossil fuel. To be sure, the challenge of meeting our energy needs without burning fossil fuel is not one easily overcome. And yet, the solutions are within our reach now. We have shown that it is feasible to transition to 100% renewable energy using just wind, water, and sunlight. And it can be done using technology that is commercially available today, and in the end, the price would be just a few cents per kilowatt hour more after you take account of externalities and extra costs that are involved. The externalities, costs related to the burning of fossil fuel that don't show up on a balance sheet but are paid by society, include the costs of building and maintaining the roads, bridges, and tunnels required to support gas drilling and waste operations, paying for the tax breaks enjoyed by oil and gas companies, the growing cost of health care, a portion of which can be attributed to the problems caused by air and water pollution from burning fossil fuels. And of course, the cost of mitigating the increasing financial burden associated with climate change. You have to get people out of the cars we drive, and we need to be driving electric cars. We shouldn't have you know, smokestacks on each of our houses that are producing greenhouse gas emissions because we're burning something to create heat. We need to have uh, you know, air source or, or ground source heat pumps. It's, it's that whole spectrum of activities that need to occur for us to succeed. We have to stop investing in fossil fuels because climate change demands it. The height of hypocrisy is to say, Let's make sure we guarantee short-term return on investment and the hell with the long-term, because in the long-term we're all dead. Despite overwhelming evidence that climate change is real and solutions are urgently needed, the gas rush continues its relentless march forward, driven by the hedge funds, banks, corporations, utilities, and individual investors who are counting on huge profits from the extraction, transportation, and delivery of natural gas. We needed to start yesterday. I think the reality is, and I think anybody at this point can even observe some of the climate changing effects occurring around us, and, and it, you, you can't shrug that off. It's things we can actually see and perceive ourselves, even on our, the human scale that we're at. We don't have much time. Um, there's far more that must be done, and it has to happen, ha has to happen very quickly. So who will stop the gas rush? The federal government is paralyzed by powerful lobbyists and wealthy political contributors with a stake in natural gas. State governments find themselves overwhelmed by corporations and unions pushing jobs and economic growth they believe will result from the exploitation of fossil fuel. And so it is that thought leaders around the country are beginning to coalesce around the idea that it falls on local governments, cities, towns, villages, and the individuals that inhabit them to start making the changes that must be made. There is no single answer to our climate problems, but we can start with a few simple ideas. Conservation is the key to our energy future and perhaps the fate of our planet. Unplug and disconnect whenever possible. Adjust the thermostat. 
Take public transportation. Meet via Skype instead of in person. Reduce energy demand at home by insulating windows and doors, installing solar hot water and electric systems, using biofuel, and specifying new construction utilizing thermal heat pumps that use the Earth's own temperature for dependable, renewable, and sustainable heating and cooling. Divest portfolios of funds that invest in the oil and gas industry. Ask your broker, your union, your college, or religious institution about their investments and advocate for clean energy funds. And finally, support public policies that encourage the rapid implementation of local, renewable, sustainable energy systems. The age of climate change is here. No longer a theoretical possibility, our warming planet is sending us powerful signals that we need to make big changes, and we need to make them now. Each one of us has a role to play. Each one has something we can do. The question is, will we do it before it's too late?